Okay, well, thank you, Wendy, and uh, there we go. Looks like I am now indeed the presenter. Fantastic. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a pretty good attendance today, which I suspect is because the uh, topic of uh, user stories is uh, one that uh, – pretty widely widespread. A lot of people use user stories, and I would guess that many of you are like many other people. Uh, even though you're using them, you're not always comfortable with them, and they don't always, uh, you don't always get them right. So um, let me just give one aside. Uh, I, I live in uh, the Boston area. Uh, which is, for those of you who, who aren't aware, it's the upper right-hand corner. And uh, this is actually a, a prominent date or a prominent anniversary because this is the 40th anniversary of the blizzard of 78, which I lived through and uh, can attest to the fact that it was quite an event. Uh, it happens to be snowing right now, but I don't think it's going to uh, approach the blizzard. Depth. So um, one other thing that I want to caution you about, some of the, um, apparently the technology that we're using does not support animations, and I use animations considerably in, uh, in some of my slides. So uh, if, if the flow seems a little strange, I apologize. It's because I didn't realize that the animations wouldn't work. So one of the things that we want to do is to uh, examine uh, why people have trouble with user stories in spite of or perhaps even because of their seeming simplicity. I'm going to make a distinction between what I call real business requirements, business deliverable what's that provide value when satisfied, uh, as opposed to product or feature requirements, which are ways how to satisfy the what's. And we want to give you a little bit of practice in using user stories to document real business requirements what's. And that I think one of the main reasons why people have difficulty writing uh, user stories is that they're focusing on the format rather than the content. And when you don't have the content right, it's real hard to get the form uh, correctly. So hopefully these things are understandable. Uh, if uh, as, as we go forward, I'm going to be encouraging you to uh, uh, give some feedback. If you uh, do it in your chat window, if you would, uh, and, um, you know, if anybody has any additional uh, uh, objectives or, or concerns about their user stories, uh, please type them into the chat window. I'm not going to be able to respond to that immediately, but, uh, you know, we do want to capture that information. So I, uh, I don't know about you, but but I, I get real tired real quickly of buzzwords. And one of, the, one of the current ones is transformation. As a matter of fact, I presented this talk at a large conference not long ago uh, where the theme of the conference was transformation. And uh, I did a quick straw poll of the people in my session, and they all almost all agreed that they were uh, – considerably tired of hearing the word transformation, especially because people just keep repeating it and oftentimes it's kind of meaningless. What I want you to realize is that transformation typically refers to significant change. Okay. A lot of our projects are not transformative, even though the literature would make it sound that way. And uh, But Getting the problem correct, the business deliverables that will reasonably solve the problem and provide needed value, which is the role of right user stories, is in fact central to transformation, but also any other project. Okay. So one thing that we're going to be doing in this session is 
trying to have you folks do a lot of the work, actively identifying, writing, and evaluating user story content and format. Now, it's a risky approach. It's made more risky by some limitations of the presentation software, but hopefully uh, uh, we're going to be able to overcome those. Okay. But one of the big advantages of user stories is that they seem very simple. And the downside that is seldom recognized, at least in my experience, is that that supposed simplicity can actually create hidden complexities that end up tripping up project teams. And when they get tripped up, they tend not to recognize what's really happening and therefore they tend not to address it appropriately. The other thing is that in my experience, and, and to, to consider your own, but it seems to me that almost everything that is said about Agile, all the uh, presentations, the, the articles, uh, many of the books, are all about things like managing user stories in a backlog rather than getting the user story content correct in the first place. We're going to try to give you some guidance, some assistance in getting the content more accurate because in my experience, when the content is inaccurate, it doesn't matter how clearly you write it, it's still not going to be helpful to you. Okay. So uh, hopefully you will all be uh, willing to participate. Uh, we, With luck, we're going to get more participation than we're going to be able to acknowledge, and I apologize in advance for that. So I'm sure that Many of you, perhaps all of you, are familiar with this general format that Mike Cohn introduced uh, for documenting user stories. And that in Agile, user stories are the vehicle for requirements. Now, there's a lot of verbiage and disagreement about exactly what, you know, what they are and are not, but User stories have something to do with requirements, and the typical format is as some kind of a user, I want or need something or another so that I can get some benefit. Okay? And this is, this is a pretty uh, uh, important and understandably uh, popular format because it's a three-liner, and you know what, who could argue with three lines, especially if you've been accustomed to uh, uh, things more complex. So, as I said, I'm going to be asking you, and I'm doing it right now, to do the bulk of the work here, and I'll try and capture a few of the things that you say, and hopefully be able to sh uh, display them on the uh, on the slides. Um, so I want you, each of you, to think of yourself as being on a team that is assisting your local chapter of either IIBA or PMI. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with both of those organizations, IIBA, International Institute of Business Analysis, uh, which has, has gone far as uh, uh, giving much more visibility to the practice of business analysis. Uh, Wendy mentioned that uh, I was um, um, a subject expert for Babock uh, version 2. They're now on version 3. Uh, but that uh, uh, Babock, the business analysis body of knowledge, is certainly one of the, the major accomplishments of IIBA. PMI, the Project Management Institute, has been roaringly successful at uh, uh, creating visibility in, in the project management community, and uh, they have a, uh, their own body of knowledge called PMBOK. It's now on the sixth edition, and uh, their uh, PMP certification has just been a roaring success 